Okay, so I wanted to go through a very quick um, kind of mix between a tutorial on how to make Bode plots and uh, kind of a reiteration of what needs to be done on the assignment. Um, so you guys have in Physics 229 a bit of a problem in that there's twice as much lab time as lecture time. So we have to do a lot of learning during the labs and the lectures are always pressed for time. However, when you're doing labs and wiring things together and trying not to get zapped and just trying to make things work, it's not always the best time to learn. So we have this problem where you, a lot of the course time is spent kind of debugging things and getting great hands-on experience. But sometimes the concepts um, are just not covered sufficiently in class due to time constraints and you're kind of left in the dark. Especially relevant um, is this stuff for this week because you have an assignment due um, for which there is no intermediate class on Monday. So I thought I'd post a video just on how to make some of these Bode plots for these filters, the frequency response to these filters. So in general, suppose we have these two impedances here, Z1 and Z2 in a voltage divider configuration. Remember that the beauty of this uh, impedance formalism is it allows us to treat AC, these linear AC circuit elements um, just using Ohm's law style and Kirchhoff's law style and Thevenin style um, rules that we've learned for DC circuits. All we have to do is agree that Z here is complex. The argument of our output will be our phase and the magnitude will be our amplitude of our, of our AC wave. So it's a very powerful tool. And remember, if these were resistors, we just have the output being R2 over R1 plus R2. Based on what we just said, the output of this is simply Z2 over the sum of Z1 and Z2. And Z could be resistors, capacitors, or inductors. So let's suppose that if it, we have a resistor and a capacitor here, the impedance of a resistor is just R. The impedance of a capacitor is minus J over omega C. And if we just plug the, this naively in, we get our frequency response. So let's load up some Python and just do that. So quite literally, I'm just gonna write Z2 over Z1 plus Z2. And that's my gain. I mean, I have to tell it what these things are, but I can write it exactly like it is in the equation, which is nice. Z1, well, Z1 is R and Z2 is R minus j over omega times c. I should give it some actual value so it knows how to do it. Let's say we have a 1 kilo ohm resistor and a 100 nanofarad capacitor. And what's frequency? We have to give it some frequency range if we're going to plot anything. So let's say frequency is defined for very near DC. I'm just going to make a linear set of uh, numbers from very near DC to say, I don't know, 100 kilohertz. And omega is 2 times pi times f. And if I made any typos, it'll be here. Oh no, no typos. Excellent. So if I want to, this makes, I think, 10 points in in between them, so let's make it a bit more robust. We'll put a thousand points here. And we can now plot the frequency um, versus the fre um, frequency response, which is just the magnitude of our gain. And what do we get? Wow, we get a little corner here. So it's probably fairly high near the beginning. And as we get out to 100 kilohertz, I meant to say 100 E3, that was a typo. Um, there we go, it starts to really flatten out. But it's not super illustrative. We could even go further, take it a bit further out. Um, let's just say a megahertz. We know that it roughly flattens out here and it goes, falls off as, looks like one or omega here but it's not really clear from this plot what's going on. It's difficult to get a big picture. We want to know the range over which things are constant and over which they fall off. So to a megahertz, it would be even more catastrophic, we can see. But we, you can see that we, we're just as interested in this range here as we are in this central range. 
So how do we get around this? One way we could do it is make a bunch of plots. Let's just say we go from 0.1 to 100. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, it's pretty constant. It only drops by 0.2% over that 100. How about 1,000? Well, now it's starting to drop off, and we could take it to maybe the 10,000, and oh, yeah, now it's, now it's starting to turn around. So we can see it's doing some interesting stuff. Maybe around, it's about a half around this 20, I don't know, what is that, about 2,800? That's one way to do it. But if we're really interested in this, what we are really interested in is um, a big picture of what's going on from, a, say, DC to a megahertz, because we might have some noise out here, and we might also want to know the frequencies that we're going to pass through on the same plot. And the solution, when you have these, we want to know um, in detail uh, over narrow ranges, but a bunch of narrow ranges that span um, a huge range, so that very awkwardly, if we want to know in a lot of detail what happens near the origin and what happens in the asymptotes when we get to very far frequencies, what you typically do is you plot this x-axis on a logarithmic scale, so we give as, many, as much weight to 1 to 10 as we do from 10 uh, 1,000 to 10,000 and 100,000 to a million <coughs> to a million. So let's do that. We'll make a semi-log plot here. And let's see what we get here. All right. So it's a little bit ugly, but we're getting we're on the right track. Now we can see here we have equally spaced coordinates. This is just in frequency. But we have equally spaced coordinates, and each of them represents a power of 10. We have this weird chunk here. Why is that? Well, our first point was at point 0.1, but we have defined a thousand equally spaced points between uh, one and a million. So the next data point is at a thousand here. What we want to do if we're plotting on a logarithmic scale is give as many points from point 0.1 to 0 as there are from, say, 1 to, uh, 1 to 10, or 1,000 to 10,000. And all we need to do is issue this nice command log space. Now we're going to go from t point 0.1, which is 10 to the minus 1, to 10 to the 6. We'll still do 1,000 points, say. And we should see a much prettier plot. That's great. So that's half our problem here. We can really see what's going on. We can see that it's flat-ish. Up to about... 100, and that starts to roll off a little bit, and then really gets steep around 2,000. But what happens out here? It's hard to tell what goes on this transition period, and also how much more attenuation do I get at a, a million versus 10,000, right? It's very hard to read from this. So the next thing we do, now that we've compressed the x-axis to a logarithmic scale, is we can write the y-axis on a logarithmic scale too. So I go log 10 of this, and the units that are normally used for this are decibels, so I just scale everything by a factor of 20. It's a little bit more convenient. And let's see what we get. So now we have our beautiful Bode plot. Let's put some grid lines on this. Um, let's call it grid true. And I'll see why in a second. So each one of these lines here, these major lines, is 10 decibels on the y-axis. And we can see the x-axis, because if we've done the semi-log plot, is scaled kind of funny. They get bunched up, and they start again, and they get bunched up. But we can really see the orders of magnitude here over which our frequency gets totally passed through. And there's this knee here, right around, I don't know, about 1,600 hertz. This one's... 1 over root 2, which is works out to be 3 decibels. We'll get to that in one sec. But we can see there's this nice, li it looks like a linear roll-off on a log-log scale. And that tells us exactly how many decibels of suppression I get every time I get a power of 10. Why? Well, let's go to 10 to the 4 here. We're about a third of the way up this uh, plot here, so maybe about minus 17 decibels, and we'll go all the way another power of 10 to 10 to the 5. Um, and we're about a third of the way up this here, so minus 37 decibels. So we went minus 20 dB. 
and this is very linear, so if we go another power of 10, we're about a third of the way up to minus 57 decibels, and we get another minus 20 decibels. So what we have here is a slope that's about minus 20 decibels per octave. And that tells us exactly how much suppression we get for this order of magnitude of frequency. We can do the same thing with phase. So to do that, we'll just make the figure a bit bigger. Let's say 12 by 3. I think these units are inches. I'm not sure. And we'll make a subplot. 1 by 2, and this is the first one. And we'll do the second plot, 1 by 2, and it's the second one. And instead of the logarithmic amplitude, we'll do the phase. So that's angle of g. It's in radians, so we'll convert it to something that we can all understand, degrees. And we can plot that guy as well. And that's the second part of a Bode plot when you actually look at the angle. It's something like that. And you can see it goes from, nine, from 0 degrees to 90 degrees, uh, negative 90 degrees, way past this band here. And that's where it asymptotes to. So this is a low pass filter. Now let's lo think about this logarithmic scale just for a, a, a minute. So suppose I had a function, f of omega, or f of x, doesn't matter. That's just 1 over x. If I have f of, say, 10, I get 0.1, f of 100, 0.01, etc. Every time I get a power of 10, well, I divide by 10. That's somewhat obvious. So let's how that look, see how that looks on the logarithmic scale. So if I go 20, first of all, let's just look at the logarithm. f of 1 gives me 0. But if I divide by, uh, get another power of 10 in x, well, I'm just at negative 1 decibel. This is how decibels work, right? 1 over 100, negative 2. That says 1 over 10 to the 2. 1 over 10 to the 3, negative 3. 1 over 10 to the 17, 17, right? So this is... going to um, uh, give, give us a scaling that we're interested in, because we're in tw 20 decibels here. So let's just say w is equal to 100. We'll look at our output power in decibels, f of w, and we get minus 40. What happens if we go at a decade to it? So we'll go 100 times 10. Well, now we're at 1,000. We get 60 dBs. What if we add another decade? We get another 10. So this is why we have this minus 20 dB per octave scaling. If we had a different transfer function that scaled more sharply, say it was f of x, 1 over x squared, let's see how that scales now. W is equal to 10, we get minus 40. We add a power of 10, minus 80. So now it's 80 decibels per octave, right? Every power of 10 just gives us 1 over a factor of 1,000. Um, I'm sorry, a factor of 100. And 100 in decibels is 2. 2 times 20, because we have this 20 up front, gives us 20. So this is why we have this uh, scaling that we've actually that we we see here of 20 decibels per octave. If this theory is correct, we should get um, if we have a transfer function that roughly goes as the square of this, it'll go as one over omega squared. So g2 is equal to g squared, and we'll plot both the Bode plot for both g. And G2 on the same plot. Let's see what we get here. Python's thinking long and hard. And this is what we get. So in the, the green one is our new transfer function. We get twice as much phase. And this is just a new filter. It's a second order filter is what it's called. 
And now, let's go follow this line. We go from, let's see, just at about, I don't know, what's that about? 1.5 times 10 to the 4, we get minus 4d dB. 1.5 times 10 to the 5, we get minus 80. So now we have, indeed, this 1 over 40, or sorry, 1 over x squared, or omega squared dependence. So we get minus 40 dB per octave. Uh, db per octave. And that's what's going on with this log scale. Now one last thing, in the labs you saw that um, uh, we were concerned with this three decibel point, or this six db point. The reason that we're interested in um, the six db point is if I have f of two here, that gives me a half, right? So if I just look at that on a logarithmic scale, that's very close to minus 6 dB. So minus 6 dB is what happens when my um, amplitude uh, is reduced by a half. So it's log 10 of a half and 20 dB. It corresponds to when the voltage drops by um, one over root two. It's a bit confusing at first, but just in words, the reason is, as you, we've learned now, power across a load, a resistive load, is V squared over R. So if the p voltage drops by one over root two, the power drops V squared over R by a half. So this is the point at which you have half as much power um, as, as you did in the output versus the input. So I, have very, I hope this cleared things up a bit. Um, you can use this video, I'll try to post I'll try to post this example on core spaces and uh, of course send me an email or see me if there's any problems making your Bode pl Bode plots for your assignment.